some uh, background about this presentation. This is the first judge presentation, uh, first judge conference presentation that I ever wrote. And uh, it's still my favorite. Uh, it's probably got some unfair bias towards it due to being my first. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, a big fan of this one. I like this, this content and I spent a lot of work on it. And then Wizards changed the rules on how continuous effects work, so I had to do a bunch more work on it. And uh, you know, that's, that's where we're at now. Um, so yeah, exciting, exciting time to be alive. And um, I, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give a, a fair warning to everybody. Um, this, uh, this is a really exciting topic for me, and so I'm gonna get excited when I give this presentation. Uh, fair warning to you right now. There might be some times when I raise my voice, so if you're a headphone user, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you guys a little taste of what might be happening here. Oh my gosh, this is such an exciting rule, guys. Who, who, who here has never heard about this rule before? So, you know, if, if, that's, uh, if that's something that uh, might, might bother you, then uh, uh, apologies, but th this, is, this is one of those things where you will uh, not make it all the way through this presentation if, if someone isn't making it exciting. So uh, one, one other thing uh, at the beginning of this presentation I wanted to bring up, um, I will be reading stuff that people post in the Discord. This one isn't as interactive as some of my other presentations that I do, um, both because of the nature of the questions involved and the types of uh, questions and answers. But if you do have questions or things that you don't understand fully, uh, definitely put it in the Discord. Uh, also, I will be reading out stuff that people post in the Discord on, on the, as, as part of the presentation. And th this presentation will be put up on YouTube, so you know, if you're concerned about me reading something that you said in the Discord aloud, uh, you know, that, that might be happening. And, and people on YouTube might get to hear me read what you wrote. So that is uh, enough, enough waffling around here. I am gonna get started with the presentation now. So, um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Dave. Um, I have a YouTube channel, it's called Judging FTW. Uh, if you're joining me on the YouTube channel, that's awesome. Uh, if you have not subscribed to it yet, be sure to subscribe. And um, this is gonna be a con, this, this is gonna be great. Continuous effects, three easy steps. Um, and so, this is gonna be so awesome. I, I can't believe it, almost. Look at all these awesome cards, everyone, look, look. Look, you got like the humility, or you got the, the artificial evolution over here, or the omnivian, or you know, all, all these awesome cards. And you know, maybe sometimes when people see uh, types of cards like this, uh, maybe, maybe they think, okay, maybe Dave should change the name of this presentation slightly. Uh, so we, we put a little question mark. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, that's that's continuous effects, right? Um, so for me, that's, that's what they feel like. But I, I could understand that maybe some other people might feel just a tiny bit intimidated um, don't worry, there might be some Blood Moon questions in this presentation at some point too. I just didn't have enough room to put all the, all the cards on the front page here. So yeah, continuous effects. So first, first uh, of the, the three easy steps, I'm sure everybody has heard the term layers before, but if you have not, or if it's been a while, uh, we'll go through a, a quick refresher here. The values of a object's characteristics are determined by starting with the object, and then all the continuous effects are applied in a series of layers in the following order. So these are the continuous effect categories that we have. And the way continuous effects work in general is if you have a continuous effect and another continuous effect, the way you decide which one of those continuous effects operates first is you look at that list that's on screen right now and you see which layer the two continuous effects belong to and then you apply them in that order. And so that is, that's how it works. Um, so uh, don't worry, we'll be getting into a lot more detail uh, about that in, in the coming slides. But first, uh, we, we have to remember all, all seven of those. So if you notice, um, helpfully on the, the right-hand side of the slide there, you see copy, control, text, type, color, ability, power, toughness. Those are all of the different types of continuous effects. So those are the seven layers. Um, and, and so now we have to come up with some kind of mnemonic to, to you know, help everybody remember them. And uh, if, if you come up with your own mnemonics, those will work a lot better than any one that I could possibly supply to you. But if you're super not creative, then okay, you know, 
fair enough. I, I understand that. So the, this is the one that I'll offer. I'll, I always uh, offer up. So it's the three C's of judging's. Uh, the, the three things that all judges love to do, which would be, of course, commander, uh, cleaning table trash, and complain about players. So if you notice, the, the red letters there kind of line up, so the, the first letters of each one in, in that phrase matches up with the, the first letters of, of what the actual layers are. So that's that's uh, the mnemonic they're on. But, but what I want to make sure everybody walks away from this presentation um, I don't actually use this mnemonic to, to remember what the order is. I actually just know what the order is. Uh, and that's my hope for all of you too. Because a lot of the time when people see continuous effects, right? They think, oh my gosh, it's so annoying. Oh, seven layers. How could anyone remember all that stuff? Oh my gosh, it's so much stuff to remember. But, but the, the thing is, it's not just like gratuitous complexity, right? Like Wizards of the Coast didn't just like come up with all this stuff and make us all try to memorize it just because it would be fun to like mess around with the judges, right? The, the reason that it's so complicated is because it's, it's necessary complexity. Uh, and so hopefully with, with the, the material that I'm gonna provide in this presentation today, hopefully that's going to make it more clear why the continuous effect system is set up the way that it is. And in doing so, hopefully that will make it make enough sense that having a cute little mnemonic like this is, is not gonna really be necessary. You can just reason it out and, and use your use your noggin to, to determine what, what the uh, effects ordering should be. And so how would that work? Well, for example, take a look at this um, one that's coming up here. So we know that copy effects always apply before control changing effects because copy effects is layer one and control changing effects is layer two, right? So what that means is if there was some possible way that we could have control changing effects happen before copying effects, what that would mean would be that it might be possible for some really weird situation to come up where I use copy enchantment to become a copy of control magic and it doesn't do anything because the copying would have happened after the control changing. And that doesn't make any sense, right? Like we, we don't want stuff that doesn't make sense in magic. So the way that it actually works is copy effects always happen in layer one which is always before control changing effects, which happened in layer two. And so because of that, we always, always, always will have a copy enchantment that's a control magic that does something because the ordering is guaranteed by the layer system. And that's, that's like the general reasoning for why layers exist. So um, here's, here's another example that I kind of like. Um, this is the actual Oracle text, by the way, um, on, on screen here, this is, this is the actual Oracle text up to, you know, functional, non-functional, uh, templating change kind of stuff that doesn't affect the answer. So this is Volrath Shapeshifter, a card that was in cube a while ago. And I, I was really a big fan of the, the cube. Can anybody in the chat identify why this says Volrath Shapeshifter has the full text of that card and it has the text to discard a card? Why does Volrath Shapeshifter not say... Volrath Shapeshifter is a copy of the top card in your graveyard, as long as that card is a creature card. Um, so it, we'll, we'll give the chat people a, a few a few seconds to respond to that question. I really like this this uh, Volrath Shapeshifter, um, very unique effect. And uh, yes, we have an answer. We have an answer. Yes, and the reason is because of the card that we just saw and the thing that we just were talking about. If we have a control magic that changes the controller of Volrath Shapeshifter. If it was a copy effect, that means that it would always apply before control changing effects. So it wouldn't be looking at its real controller's graveyard, it would be looking at some other person's graveyard and becoming a creature that was based on what that person had in their graveyard. And then the control magic would assign control of the person uh, of the Volrath Shapeshifter to a different player. So it had to be a text changing effect because a text changing effect is the, the next layer down. So if you have a control changing effect, it will always apply before a text changing effect. So Wizards has this really excellent, uh, you know, kind of hack. Uh, it, it's not super pretty, but it is a thing that they could do and it changed only a little bit and it basically works all the time now the way that people think that it should work. And that's important, that's important. Okay, so um, you, you can go on with, with these. So like the, the artificial evolution, if you had an artificial evolution that changed the hive stone into a goblin stone, uh, we wouldn't want there to be a possibility that the hive stone was still making everything into slivers even though we turned it into a goblin stone, right? Like that doesn't make any sense. 
or like if we had a March of the Machines and a Darkest Hour, we would want all the artifacts to be black creatures. We wouldn't want some of the creatures to be black creatures and some of them to be non-black creatures. We just want all of them to be the, the March of the Machines applying first to make all of the stuff into creatures and then uh, the, the Dark Tower to make everything black. Same same thing with the Thran Lens and the Maze Behemoth. You, you guys are probably starting to get the, the hang of things by now, right? So the, like, the Thran Lens makes everything colorless and then Maze Behemoth gives all the multicolored creatures trample, but there are no, none anymore. Oh, 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 ooh, 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 this one, this one's really fun, right? Right, so like, look, look, at, look at what Humble does. So Humble takes away all the abilities from, from Godhead of all, right? So what that does is it fixes it so you cannot uh, make all the, the other creatures one ones, right? Because that the ability got took away. So basically, um, that's that's what layers are, right? Like that's that's what they are and, and it's how they work. And, and it's it's like the general broad strokes overview of why layers exist. So any any questions about any of that stuff? Um, like I say, I uh, uh, have a, a fair amount of stuff in here. Um, yeah, yeah, the, the ability before power toughness is why there's no cards that say creatures you control with power four or greater have trample. Yeah, and they, they probably really wanted to put that when they were in, um, when they were in, uh, Tarkir, uh, cause that, that would have been like a, an interesting idea for a mechanic, but yeah, they can't do that. There will be some other stuff uh, like that coming up in the presentation here. So, okay, you know what's more fun than layers? Wait, I just realized something, guys. What's more fun than layers? That's right, sub layers, right? So like, imagine if we had a way to put like even more layers into the into the system, right? We, we could put like even more layers and, and we could call them something else so the players might not get overloaded by the fact that now we have more than seven of them. Um, so this is in fact one of the one of the things that changed. I had to, I had to put this part in when I uh, was, was making my uh, revisions for the presentation this time around. So this, this is one thing that they added in. And so there, there are actually two sub layers for the copy effects layer now. And basically what they did is they fixed it. So if something is face down, it has like game rules assigning values to it. Uh, it I believe there might be one specific card where it assigns some characteristics to the thing that turns it face down. But generally it's the game rules that give it the uh, being a 2-2 two -two and having no abilities and no uh, mana cost and all that other stuff. So, but, but, um, in, in general, the way it works is uh, the, the game rules give something a, a, a characteristics while it's turned face down. And so that happens as part of the copy effect layer. Um, that, that is something that changed uh, during the, the last round of, of revisions that they did to the continuous effects section of the CR. Uh, and that, that is probably like one of the biggest change. Uh, the other the other kind of interesting thing, as as was alluded to before uh, in, in Isaac's presentation, the um, the continuous effects changing the characteristics of mutated creatures uh, that that is also a copy effect. Although that happens in the same layer and sub layer as regular copy effects, and so that's the reason why we had uh, before with the previous question. If you make a copy of a mutated creature, you get an actual copy of the whole mutated creature with like all the stuff that they mutated onto it. So that's that's kind of cool. Here's another kind of cool uh, situation. This, this can like kind of give everybody an idea of um, uh, of how that would work. So uh, in, in the chat briefly, just what's the power and toughness of, of Tree Spring Lorien? We've got face down Tree Spring Lorien and it blocked the permeating mass. So what, what are Tree Spring Lorien's new power and toughness after that happens. Um, so we'll give everybody a, a couple seconds to reply here. And this is actually like kind of interesting, um, the, the way this works. Uh, and again, they, they didn't really change anything about how this worked because as far as I'm aware, the answer to any rules questions has not changed with this with this new uh, uh, sub layers in, in layer one issue. But the, the way that we kind of think about stuff uh, and yeah, that, that is in fact correct. We, we've got, we got some answers in the chat, yes. Uh, it is a 2-2. The Tree Spring Lorien is face down, and that is a later sublayer than the copy effects changing its characteristics. So even though a Tree Spring Lorien has turned into a permeating mass, it is not a uh, any different power and toughness-wise. Now there is one very important difference, uh, and that is if you wanted to turn it face up. Um, because it is a copy of permeating mass, it does not have morph anymore. So if you tried to turn it face up, uh, the first step to doing that would be to, to reveal what the front face is and show that it has morph, but you won't be able to do that anymore because when you reveal the front face of it, even though the word morph is actually written on the card, uh, the game will know that it is a copy of permeating mass. So the permeating mass will have overwritten that. 
So that's kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, you could you could use something like break open or like there's probably a couple of other ones that I'm forgetting about. You know, the the cloud shift, you could cloud shift it. You, you could get it face up if you really, really wanted to, but it'd be a challenge. Um, okay, so and then then we've got the sub layers that people are probably like more used to, which is the, the power and toughness changing ones. And they actually did change this too. Um, layer C used to actually be uh, two different things. It used to have effects as its own sub layer and counters being its own sub layer. Um, and I, I thought about changing the the example question that I had around there uh, to to make that. But uh, we're we're not uh, we're, we're going to use the same example question that I always use. So. Um, the, the summary for that is characteristic defining abilities is first. Um, and, and you can see that I've highlighted the, the T in Tarmogoyf because Tarmogoyf is a great example card for that. Uh, Non-characteristic defining abilities that set the power and toughness it would be something like Omnivian, which don't worry, we'll show Omnivian up on the, on the, the screen here shortly and you'll be able to see what that does. Uh, and then after that, uh, you've got plus X and minus X effects, so something like Augur Spree or counters, counters are applied in the same sublayer now, uh, which would be something like Decree of Savagery, which puts four plus one plus one counters on a thing. Uh, and then finally, after everything else, we've got power and toughness switching effects, such as Strange Inversion. So it, it works exactly the same way as layers. Um, so you've got characters to find abilities always first, and then stuff that sets the base power and toughness always next. And then plus X, plus X, and minus X, minus X is always after that. And then switching is the very end. So um, you might notice that, hey, look, look, it, guys, it spells out toads. It spells out toads, right? Right? So um, here, here's our, like, kind of example question. And we'll, we'll step our way through this one. So we got Tarmogoy, uh, which has four plus one plus one counters on it due to Decree of Savagery. And then Omnibian hits it. And then Augur Spree and Strings Inversion. So all this stuff happens to Tarmogoy in that order. What's the answer? And wow, that's confusing. Look at all those cards. How will I ever go through it? And believe me, um, I, I wanted to make this uh, in the beginning when I when I was making this presentation up, I wanted it to be frogs. Uh, at the time, there was no R. Uh, there was no base power and toughness setting thing. Now we have reduce in stature, so I could rewrite the uh, question to make to make a, a new, better acronym. Uh, but, you know, as you can see, uh, we did not opt to do that. So, okay, so we've got the Tarmogoyf, and uh, we're gonna go straight through in the in the order that we described. So first it's gonna be the T layer, um, and next is gonna be the Omnibian layer, making it a 3-3. Three, three. Uh, next we've got the Augur Spree, which makes it a, a plus four, minus four. Uh, and then its toughness is now negative one. So in the chat now, uh, we know what should happen, right? Right, it dies, because uh, it has zero toughness. But in fact, in fact, it does not. It does not because whenever a player would get priority is when state-based actions happen. Players do not get priority during the middle of the state uh, continuous effects being applied. They only get priority at the very end of the process. So the state-based actions do not know nor care what the toughness of Tarmogoyf was at any point in this process prior to the very, very end. And so um, the reason that this works out is because we played the cards in a specific order so that there was no point uh, even along that sequence where its toughness was zero. But uh, with, with all of them together, uh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that its toughness dips below zero in, in the middle of it. So indeed it is a seven negative one and then the four plus one plus one counters from the Decree of Savagery uh, will be put on it. And then the Strange Inversion will be the last thing to apply, um, making it a three left. So that's, that's how this works. Any questions in the chat? And uh, I, I wanna stress again, uh, the reason this works and the way that this works, it makes no difference at all what order these effects were played in, with the caveat that its toughness can't have ever ended up at negative one. Um, so as long as these effects are played in an order that allows the Tarmogoyf to live through the entire sequence, then yes, it does not matter at all what the order is uh, or which of these five effects started first, uh, the end result will always be a 311. And so that's kind of nice, right? I, I like that. Um, okay, so no questions, great, great. Moving on to uh, the next the next thing uh, which is you know speaking of, of power and toughness changing stuff what, what about this one right we've got a diminish and we've got a, a sorcerer's queen right what would what would be the power and toughness of a creature that had both of these effects uh, put onto it and so the the answer is we don't know uh, or, or I should say we don't know yet based on what we have talked about um, so the obvious answer that everybody is, is now typing in the chat is, is of course, timestamps, right? So again, 
Wizard's goal was not to make the system the easiest for the judges to remember. Wizard's goal was to make it so that the continuous effect system gave you the intuitively correct answer the most number of times possible. And so as a result, the obvious answer for the, the um, Sorcerer's Queen plus Diminished question would be which of these started first should start applying first and whichever of those effects started applying later should overwrite the first one. And so yes, yes, that's exactly how it happened. It's perfect. It works out perfectly. Okay, so within each layer and sub layer, uh, you, you determine using a timestamp system. And these are all the ways that you can get a timestamp. Um, actually, I lied. There's also these uh, as well. So I kind of tried to digest that for you into a, a little bit more approachable uh, form that has a lot less text on it. Uh, if you don't like reading the CR, then uh, th this is like some kind of quick hits. Basically, all that really tiny text on the previous two slides, most of it boils down to saying an effects timestamp is when the effect started. Uh, now, for different types of continuous effects, there's different types of, you know, thing, but usually your intuitive understanding of when the effect started is going to be correct. Uh, there is also a couple of different other things uh, that, that you want to point out here, uh, which is that if two time two objects would get a timestamp at the same time, uh, we use the app-nap order to determine what the timestamp order is, and if either, uh, you know, if, if either player controls two objects that are entering at the same time, that player chooses the relative order of their timestamp. So this works exactly the same way as um, triggered abilities getting put on the stack, so you can use that to kind of like help you remember. This is also something that was new. In the past, I believe the uh, active player would just always choose what the what the ordering was. And the reason they changed this, I'm almost certain, is because now when someone plays a show and tell and they don't say that my gristle brand has an earlier timestamp than your basic land, then that player did not commit a game rule violation. So I'm, I'm relatively confident that that's the reason why they changed that. And, and you know, I, I'm, I support that change. That's a good change. Um, one other important thing, oh, we, we've got a, a, a not why. Well, you know, that's one really nice consequence of that uh, change then. Um, I, I would always complain about that, that specific one. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is the equipments and, and also auras and fortifications, but, but mostly equipments is the reason that, that this comes up with, uh, they need to actually physically move to a new object to receive a new timestamp. Uh, so if, if I have an equipment that's attached to my creature, I can't just equip, play the equip ability targeting that same creature. Uh, it has to physically move to a new creature in order to get a new timestamp. Um, so that is, that is basically like all you need to, to know about how timestamps work. So, um, yeah, if, if you have a diminish and you have a sorcerer's queen, whichever one started later is, is going to win, right? Like we'll, we'll, we use the term win to mean be the one that actually is the, the final power toughness of the, of the creature. So, okay. That is, that is timestamps. Um, what, what, what does everybody think? Anybody got any, uh, interesting questions or, or doesn't understand everything so far? Okay, excellent. Um, we are now in a great spot. We are now in an amazing spot because we can now answer one of the first and best continuous effects questions ever considered by Judge Kind, right? So opalescence and humility. If you have both of these out in the same place, you know, if you have both these cards on the battlefield at the same time, what do you get? Okay, okay, you do not get a, a splitting headache you get well we we know how to do it so we'll we'll, we'll go through it so uh, again we're going to use layers um we're going to break everything up into its appropriate layers and i have them listed on the right hand side if you don't have them all memorized yet that's perfectly fine um so number one is uh the the type changing layer uh, that that happens in layer four that is the first of the seven layers where something interesting happens um so we see enchantment creature uh humility uh being an enchantment has been turned into a creature uh, and then the next step would be the, uh, well, nothing happens in the color layer, but in the abilities layer, uh, humility, which is now a creature, is going to lose all of its abilities. Um, and then finally, the, the power and toughness changing layer, uh, we have two possibilities. Um, you know, the opalescence has a later timestamp, then it will overwrite the humility, making it a 1-1. Uh, on the other hand, if the humility has a later timestamp, the humility will uh, apply later and overwrite the opalescence and, and then end up being a 1-1. So, you know, whichever, whichever one of Opalescence and Humility has a later timestamp, that, that one will uh, be the final ultimate power and toughness for Humility. Any, any questions about that? Any questions about that? This is, this is kind of a, you know, really famous question. And a lot of people, um, you know, talk about it like it's some kind of huge boogeyman. It's like completely un unbelievable. 
you know, it's really challenging. But when you when you know how the layers work and you step through everything step by step, um, it, it actually does get a little a little bit simpler. Okay, now that's a very interesting point. We've got a very interesting question in the chat. The question is why do we not have this situation happening? Anyone remember when I was talking about this like a few minutes ago where I said like, oh yeah, the humble takes away the Godhead of Oz abilities. And so that, therefore the Godhead of Oz abilities don't apply uh, in, in layer seven when they're supposed to. So, okay, why? What, you know, did, did Dave like make a mistake in his presentation and then, you know, put in a slide that specifically calls out the same mistake? Um, well, you know, that's possible, I suppose. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's actually this, this rule here. Um, so if you see, um, if an effect starts to apply in one layer or sublayer, and there, therefore it will continue to be applied to the same set of objects in every applicable uh, layer and sublayer, even if the ability is removed during this process. And so as a result, yes, yes indeed, uh, as a result of that rule, humility does get to apply in layer seven because it started to apply in layer six. And so therefore it will continue to apply uh, in, in every subsequent layer to the same set of objects, in, in this case, humility itself. So great question, um, and I was really hoping that someone would put that uh, put that out there because yeah, that that if, if you think about it, it doesn't make sense. And if you had never seen that rule before, there's no reason why you would believe me uh, why those situations would work differently. So yeah, that's that's a, that is in fact a, a great question. Great question. So um, anything else before we move on to the uh, the next? Okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. This is great. This one. This one. I really love. This is actually uh, an example from a historical game of Magic. It was played between uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh, who you see on the left there, and John Rockefeller on the right. And so what happened was um, Carnegie played a steel hell kite, and afterwards <laughs> Rockefeller put a control magic on it. Right. Right. And so then Carnegie didn't like that. So he wanted his dragon back, so he played a <laughs> steel enchantment <laughs> on, on the control magic. Now, which player will control steel Hellkite after, after this happens? So um, if, if you didn't catch what the, the steel enchantment does, it does exactly what you think it does. Uh, you control enchanted enchantment. Um, so what, what will the result of all of this be? And so, I know the right answer and I know the, the wrong answer, but let's let's do what I always preach to everybody to do. Um, let, let's do what I what I always preach to and, and say, we'll, we'll just go through step by step and, and puzzle it out, right? So these both apply in layer two, both control changing effects. Um, the steel enchantment has a later timestamp, which means control magic will apply first and then steel enchantment will apply. So first of all, we'll have Control Magic will assign control of Steel Hellkite to Rockefeller. And then afterwards, the Steel Enchantment will assign control of Control Magic to Carnegie. And um, at that point, it won't really matter that Carnegie controls the Control Magic um, because Steel Hellkite has already been assigned control of, by Control Magic. So um, does this make sense? Uh, d d does, does everybody like <laughs> where this rule is at, uh, you know, obviously, of course not, right? So th these guys are both billionaires. They donated billions of dollars to magic tournaments throughout the years. So they asked the magic rules team, hey, could we get this fixed? Could, could, could we get it so that the obvious right answer ends up being the right answer? Uh, and so indeed we, we can. And we, we came up with a really great, a delightful tool <laughs> For, for solving situations like this. And it's, it's called dependencies. Uh, if you don't like reading CR text, here's, here's kind of a paraphrase uh, that makes it a little bit easier to, to work out how that uh, effect works. So a continuous effect is dependent on another one if they're both applied in the same layer and if applicable sublayer. And applying the other one first would change its text or existence or what objects it applies to or what it does to those objects. And I kind of glossed over a couple of details in the explanation uh, you know, they, they also like have to either not be continuous uh, characteristic defining abilities or both be characteristic defining abilities. But that's that's like the basic part of it. Um, and dependent effects are applied directly after those that they depend on, regardless of what the timestamps say. So let's take a look at how that would exam uh, how that would work in our example question here. So if we look at our control changing layer, they're both applied in the same layer. And if we apply the steel enchantment 
first, then that will change what control magic does to the objects that it affects. So therefore we would say that control magic is dependent on the steel enchantment. Uh, conversely, the steel enchantment is not dependent upon the control magic. Uh, applying steel enchantment first does not change, uh, or applying control magic first does not change anything about what steel enchantment does. So as a result, we apply control magic last and that gives us the result we were hoping for. So that is what dependencies are all about. That's the reason why dependencies exist. Um, and all those like wacky rules questions you've probably heard about that involve dependencies, uh, well, those are kind of a, an unfortunate byproduct of the fact that we needed some sort of system that would give us the obviously correct answer in cases like this one here. Okay, so any questions about that? All right, excellent. Now, now we're in a really great spot. Um, we, we solved this problem and now we're ready for, okay, you know, I, I, I checked, I'm, I'm going to have to run it by the rules team here. I'm not sure if I could legally call myself a continuous effects presentation, if I didn't have this example in there somewhere. Um, so, you know, we, we got the blood moon, we got the Urborg. And, uh, once again, we're, we're now in a great spot because we now have all the tools that we need to solve, uh, yet another really famous, uh, continuous effects question from the judge ball. Right, so we're gonna go through um, uh, the type changing layer is the, the first one where these happen and, and they, they both apply in layer four, so um, nothing, nothing too crazy about that. Now notice that if we apply the blood moon first, that will change whether Urborg has any abilities at all because when you make a land into a mountain, that takes away all of its abilities. Um, on the other hand, applying the Urborg first does not change anything about what the Blood Moon applies to. And so as a result, we will say that the Urborg depends on Blood Moon and applies last. And so what do we end up with? We end up with Urborg the Mountain of Yawgmoth because Urborg will not have any abilities when it comes time for it to get a turn to apply its abilities. And so therefore, no stuff will happen during that point and it will just be a normal mountain, um, a legendary mountain. Uh, but nothing will be a swamp, certainly. So, all right, a little sad um, about how that works, but uh, yep, that's uh, that's how it that's how it is. Okay, so any any questions about how this this question works in the chat? No. Okay, great, great. Okay, so now we're on. <laughs> oh boy. Oh man, this is great. That, oh man, I love this question so much. Right. Okay, so. We've got these two in play. Uh, the chosen type is Sapperling, of course, uh, for the conspiracy. So creatures you control are Sapperlings, and then all forests and all Sapperlings are one one green Sapperling creature tokens, forest lands, in addition to their other types. So that's what we got. That's what we're. That's what we got. And and we also have these two. Uh, so we have a basic forest, and we have a gutter skulk, which is just like some random black creature. Um, it has uh, it's it's not a Sapperling. That's that's an important part of the of the, of the question here. So. What will be the result? So we're going to take a look at the type changing effect layer first. And that is indeed where both of these, uh, or at least the first, the first layer where either one of these would apply. Now, I want to call attention to something very interesting here. And I, I could barely believe how excited I was when, when I saw this. Now, look at how if we apply the conspiracy first, then that's gonna turn our gutter skulk into a sapperling. And that means that life and limb has additional stuff that it can apply to. So that's pretty cool, right? But, but, but we're not even done yet. But wait, there's more. If we apply the life and limb first, that would mean that the forest is turned into a creature, which means that the conspiracy has an additional object that it can apply. Isn't that so cool? Isn't that so cool, guys? There's, they're, they're both dependent on each other. It's like a loop. It's like the, the circle of life. No? It's not, okay. So what do we do? Okay, so usually um, it, when I'm doing this presentation live, I'll, I'll like point to someone in the audience and browbeat and be like, okay, what do we do? What do we do? It's an emergency. And so again, we have to think about what's our goal, right? We're Wizards of the Coast. We want the most people possible to be able to guess what the right answer is. So what would we do? What is the correct answer in this situation? And the answer is, uh, if several dependent effects form a dependency loop, then that dependency rule gets ignored 
and they are applied in timestamp order. So there you go. That's that's the answer. So timestamps decide whether we should apply conspiracy or life and limb first. So of course we will um, you know go go through the the example case and see how that will look. So if if we say that life and limb has a earlier timestamp than conspiracy, what will happen is the following. So first of all. Um, in the type changing effects, uh, we will turn the forest into a basic land creature hyphen forest sapperling. The gutter skulk is not a forest or a sapperling, so it will not be affected at all uh, until it gets time for conspiracy to apply, in which case conspiracy will apply and make it a sapperling. Um, and then, then it's time for the, the color changing. So the, the life and limb does make all of the stuff into green and it makes it into one ones also. So. Uh, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, the forest is green, but, but the gutter skulk isn't. Why? Why? Does anybody know? Oh my gosh, it's an emergency. I made a mistake with my PowerPoint. I gotta, I gotta like edit some stuff really quick. Quick, quick, everybody have wait. Any, anybody uh, have a guess as to why the forest turned green, but the gutter skulk did not turn green? Uh, lands are colorless. Well, you know, that, that's true, but like, you know, Life and Limb is saying that all forests and all saplings should be green. So what, what's the, what's the, the situation here? Um, I, I will spoil for all of you. Yes, there is a, a reason why I, I did not make the gutter skull green, um, only the forest. And the reason is um, something that came up earlier in the presentation. And it's, it, it actually applies here too, but it might be a little bit more subtle uh, in this case, which is that if an effect starts to apply in one layer, then it will continue to apply to the same set of objects in every other subsequent layer. And so, as a result, this is just like what we had with the humility and opalescence question. And this is, this, by the way, this, this rule, this rule you see here hardly ever comes up. And I managed to squeeze it into two example questions here. I managed to squeeze this random rule that nobody's ever really heard of probably into two different example questions and does completely different things. And, and it's, it's really, so I, I was really proud of that one too. So, okay. So that's the reason why uh, the gutter skulk is not green. It's also the reason why it's not a one, one. Uh, here also uh, same same thing the the life and limb does not apply to the gutter skulk in any layers because when life and limb started to apply it did not apply to gutter skulk so it doesn't matter the possibility that gutter skulk might now be something that life and limb would want to apply to uh, so th this would be our final answer right so that that is life and limb plus conspiracy so now now we're in a a, a great spot any any questions about this um, before we move on to the next example. Psych! Psych! You guys didn't think I would do that, did you? You guys didn't think that I would be able to move on to the next example without examining what might happen if conspiracy is applied first. We aren't done with this one yet. No, no. So, okay. Now, now let's take a look at what's what would be different if conspiracy has an earlier timestamp. So now conspiracy is going to apply and then afterwards the... Um, the life and limb. So first of all, in the type changing layer, conspiracy is going to apply first and make the gutter skulk into a sapperling. Then, then we're going to have uh, life and limb apply, and it's going to make all the forests and sapperlings into forest sapperlings. And you notice that now gutter skulk is a forest sapperling because it was a sapperling at the time when life and limb started to apply. So that's good. That's good. So now it's turned into a forest, and you notice that it has an ability now. Um, does the ability bother anybody? Do, do, is, is anybody perturbed by the fact that it randomly got an ability on it? Um, so you shouldn't be because uh, the, that ability comes from the game rules. It does not come from continuous effects, so it does not need to wait until the appropriate layer for that ability to be added on. Uh, rather, the, the game rules just give it that ability at that time. So that, that is in fact the, the correct Thing, it, it will get that ability in layer four, even though stuff that gives you abilities doesn't usually give you the ability until layer six. So that, that is in fact correct. Uh, color, we notice that they are both green now. So again, because the life and limb started to apply to the gutter skulk and the forest, it will continue to apply to both of them in all the uh, applicable sub layers. And so yeah, it's green and you notice that the power and toughness has been adjusted to a one one. So that's the real uh, end of this question. Is there, is there any uh, questions or concerns about how that works? No? Okay, let's do a little bit of a wrap up here. So continuous effects in three easy steps. We, step one, parse all the effects into their proper layers and applicable sub layers. That's the layers. 
that's the sub layers. Uh, there, there's new sub layers for layer one now. Just remember that morph is after everything else. Every there's the everything else layer, and then there's the morph making it a two two layer. Uh, you can grossly think of it like that if you don't mind losing a little bit of nuance. Uh, then we apply the effects with earlier timestamps first, and then the effects with later timestamps after. But we apply dependent effects immediately after the effects that they depend on regardless of timestamps. And what is dependency as well? A continuous effect is dependent on another one if they are both in the same layer and sub layer and applying the other one first would change its text or existence, which is what we saw in the Blood Moon plus Urborg example, or what objects it applies to, which was what we had in the Conspiracy Life and Limb example, or what it does to those objects, which is what we had in the Steel Enchantment plus Control Magic example. Dependent effects are applied directly after those they depend on, regardless of timestamps, but we bring the timestamps back if there is a dependency loop. And with that, are there any questions? But remember, please be gentle because, you know, I, I'm, I'm only one person. <laughs> All right, so we've got a couple of people uh, typing in the chat here. Um, mostly surprised that the conspiracy doesn't always apply first. <laughs> yeah, it's it's true. Uh, that's it's actually not true. Um, the uh, um, it, it is true that everything does end up being a sapling, uh, no matter whatever order the stuff is applied to in. However, the conspiracy stuff. Uh, the, the dependencies are based on what the conspiracy does and what the life and limb does. And the conspiracy definitely does do different things depending on the ordering. Um, okay, we're, we're, uh, we, have some, we have some exciting uh, continuous effects questions that I'm really excited to hear about. You can email those to me at, at judgingftw at gmail.com. Um, if you got any like wacky like continuous effect questions uh, that you want to put in. But but don't worry. Don't worry, friends. We got some more continuous effects questions to, to, to spice things up with here. So don't worry. Don't worry. Um, so a couple more uh, questions because we've got a few more minutes left to go before they're going to cut me off the mic here. Let's say we have a grizzly bear slash phantasmal image. So the, the card that you see on the left there is a phantasmal image, which is a copy of grizzly bears, right? So that's the reason why it's got the art for phantom image, but it's like got the like grizzly bear information on it. Now we're gonna play a clone and we're gonna make the clone be a copy of phantasmal image. What do you all think? Will the clone be a illusion and will the clone have the ability when this becomes the target of a spell or ability, sacrifice it. Um, so we've got some people that say yes. Um, and so that is in fact correct. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit weird though, right? Um, because if we take a look, here, here's where a copy is. You, you see how the copy is like right here, but you see how the type and the abilities is over here after the copy. So why is this? How does that happen? And the, the reason is because we, we kind of had to hack it in a little bit, right? So what Wizards did is they fixed it so that like stuff like Phantom Image where it becomes a copy and then the thing that makes it into a copy also like says some other stuff like it gives it some extra creature types or it gives it some extra um, abilities or maybe it changes its name. Uh, with those types of effects, that, that stuff is all considered to be part of the copy effect. So that's the reason why Clone when it becomes a copy of Grizzly Bear slash Phantom Image, it does get to pick up on the illusion typing and the becomes a target of a spell or ability sacrifice it ability. So that's why that um, gets put in there. Okay, so next we've got Mutavault. I love Mutavault. I remember when it came out in Morning Tide. And you know what else came out in Morning Tide? Changelings. Now, let's get the tinfoil hat out here for a little bit here. Look at how it says it becomes a 2-2 with all creature types. Now, why would they have not said it's a 2-2 with Changeling, right? Wouldn't that have made a lot more sense? I don't know how I feel about that. Maybe that corset plant is the, the reason why they did that. Or, or maybe let's take a look at how it might look if we had a hypothetical printing of Mutavault that said it becomes a 2-2 creature with Changeling until end of turn, and it's still a land. Um, so in layer four, the type, subtype, and supertype changing layer, it will turn into a land creature. Uh, then in the abilities adding layer, it will have changeling. And you notice that the changeling is not gonna do anything because 
it was supposed to apply in layer four and it's now layer six. So that's the reason why Mutavault does not have the uh, ability Gains Changeling. And that's the reason why you're never gonna see any cards printed that say Gains Changeling, loses Changeling, Gains Devoid, loses Devoid, uh, because they don't work, right? Like nothing is gonna happen uh, because of how layers work. So they, they would have to change how continuous effects work again uh, in order to make a card that said target thing gains all uh, gains devoid. In order to make that card do what it's supposed to do, they, they would need to change how continuous effects work. So, um, and, and then of course they did reprint it in a core set. So all, all the like, you know, 300 IQ people out there who was talking about how like, no, it's not a core set plant. They only worded it that way because that's how they had to do it. Uh, you know, we, we ended up getting fools made out of anyway. So, okay, that's kind of lame. Humility Painter Servant. This is another kind of uh, good one that kind of goes along those same type of lines, right? So we got the Humility, we got the Painter Servant, Painter Servant naming blue. In the color changing layer, which is layer five, Painter Servant is gonna make everything blue. And then in the abilities removing layer, the Humility is gonna remove all abilities from Painter Servant, except it doesn't matter because Painter Servant's ability already did what it was supposed to do. So that's the reason why Humility is bad to bring in against the Painter Servant decks uh, in most cases. Um, also does not work against Magus of the Moon for similar reasons. Um, the, the Magus of the Moon, of course, applying in the type, subtype, and supertype changing layer, which is also before the ability adding and removing layers. So that is um, a, another kind of like extra bonus tip for you all there. And speaking of Blood Moon, I got to say, guys, I, I, I have to say, this, this next one is going to be my favorite. The, I, I've written a lot of rules questions in my day, okay? This is the favorite rules question that I have ever made. Right here. Right here. Conversion plus Blood Moon. Who's excited? Who's excited? Oh my gosh. All right. So, if you've never heard of Conversion before, go ahead and read it. Basically, it says all mountains are plains. Um, there's, there's like some other text on there. Um, but th that's, that's flavor text as far as we're concerned. What, what we care about is all mountains are plains. And then Blood Moon, of course, we've probably all heard of that card before. So, okay, what do, we, what do we do? Well, let's say we've got a volcanic island, right? We've got a volcanic island and we have both those cards in play. And we want to know what kind of mana can we tap for with this volcanic island. Okay, so um, obviously they both apply in the type, subtype, supertype, changing layer, uh, layer four. We're going to, uh, you know, they, they, they both have type, subtype, two, super type, changing layers, so we go based on timestamp, right? Like that, that's how we know how to do it, right? So we'll say the conversion um, has the earlier timestamp because it appears in the question earlier. So we've got conversion, gonna make it into a plains, and then we've got blood moon, gonna make it into a mountain. Now, just that easy. Um, you know, bo both of those effects apply, um, so you apply them in timestamp order. No, no real, no real crazy stuff going on here. Now, that's kind of cool, but that's not that's not best rules question Dave has ever invented cool, right? So it's kind of cool, but it's not super stop the press is cool. Now, here's where we get super stop the press is cool. Same exact setup, same everything. Everything is exactly the same, same game. Player plays an underground C and then calls you over. Judge, judge, what, what about now? What land types are my lands now? Okay, so let's let's take a look here. Well, you know, we, we go based on timestamps again, except, except let's take a look really carefully. If we apply Blood Moon first, well, that would mean that we have Underground Sea, which is now a mountain, and therefore Conversion has additional objects that it can apply to. Uh, if, if we apply the Conversion first, nothing is going to stop or start being a non-basic land, so the Blood Moon uh, will not be dependent on that. But... The conversion is dependent on Blood Moon and therefore will apply after Blood Moon now. So we start out with applying Blood Moon, then we apply conversion, and now our lands are plains where they used to be mountains. So this, of course, brings up a kind of an interesting, weird type of a question here, right? So if we handle dependencies like that, why? Right? This is something that, that someone else asked me a while ago uh, when I gave this presentation at, a, at another um, judge conference. They asked me, is there like a list that we can look at to see all the different types of dependencies that there is? 
um, the way there is for like the, the missed triggers where they have the list that says which ones are detrimental and which ones uh, are not generally considered detrimental. And so the reason for that, uh, I, I gave him the answer no, and the reason that the answer is no is because we couldn't make such a list. We, we would have to, um, the whether two cards are dependent or not does not depend on only what those cards do, but also what every other stuff in the board state is. And at first that seems like kind of a dumb way to set it up, right? Why wouldn't you just make an absolute, yes, these two continuous effects are dependent on each other. No, they're not. And the reason is because of stuff like this. If you wanted to make whether a dependency existed be an absolute thing that was only a characteristic of what those two continuous effects did, you would have to know how they might interact with every other past and present and sometimes future magic card that they might have. It might be the case that two effects are dependent on each other in a uh, legacy tournament, but they aren't in modern because the card that makes them dependent means that they uh, you know, it isn't in modern, it's only in legacy. So that's the reason why they, they set that up that way. Um, it's, it's kind of a, um, doesn't make sense if you don't know the reasoning behind it, but that's, that's the reason why that is. And so that's, that's kind of cool. Um, that is my favorite rules question that I've ever come up with myself. Uh, I was extremely proud of it. I still remember that, that time on the, on the floor when I like literally had my jaw drop when I was like checking the stuff furiously on my phone to make sure it was worded the way it was. So yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, so now, now we're in the actual, um, end of the presentation. Thank you all for uh, showing up and paying attention and being an awesome audience. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions or comments, fill them out in the feedback form and or uh, let me know at judgingftw at gmail.com. So thank you all.